How's it going, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Whistlekick, a martial arts radio. Today, I'm joined by Tim Rediger. And as always, I'm Jeremy Lesniak. Thank you for joining us. We're going to, you know, I don't know what we're going to talk about today, but we're going to find out in a minute. If you want to support us, remember whistlekick.com. Check out all the things that we're doing, everything from Whistlekick Alliance, the program that we run, organize for martial arts schools, to our Patreon for behind the scenes content, to the store. And you can save 15% on anything in the store with the code PODCAST15. Tim, thanks for being here. Yeah. Appreciate well, thanks it. Thanks for having me. Yeah. You, you trained with, with us yesterday. You were at Marshall Summit. Yeah. You know, that was a good time. Yeah. Yeah. It was uh, uh, nice to get out and meet <laughs> new people. Um, I tend to... I, I'm, I'm not narrow in my experience. I like to get out see different things so and that that's for everything in life but yeah Yeah. martial arts too so were you always like that with martial arts yeah i think um to to a point you know i came into it in a formalized setting Mm. pretty late um i did a little bit here and there growing up i had a lot of friends that were into it but my parents were dead against it really so i kind of learned haphazardly you had to learn on the side from friends who were training they show you stuff and then later um you know friends who were like ex-military guys and things like that and also just being a biologist and when you're in that in your college years and your whatnot um a lot of seasonal jobs Mm -hmm. so you really couldn't commit to you know a lot of the schools they're like oh well you got to pay for a year up front and it's like well you know, I don't know where I'm going to be in three or four months. Right. And uh, so um, my actual formalized training started a little later, um, but it was pretty good. And it, uh, that first instructor, he was great. And he had a very strict focus in what in the Jeet Kune Do world would might be considered uh, what they call originalist, the kind of the most basic form of it. But since then, I've kind of expanded a little bit. And uh, that, but that's how I've kind of been with everything. I remember yeah. even like in graduate school, once <clears throat> I was reading a book on grizzly bears while I was running a huge data set. And one of the professors on my committee comes in and he's like, why are you reading a book on grizzly bears? He's like, you're a fish biologist. And I said, well, it's interesting to me. And he literally walks away shaking his head. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, you know, to me, you know, and I see that integration and, you know, and again, later in my career, we saw that where parvovirus came to Isle Royal National Park, and that resulted in the northern pike fish having poor growth rates. Mm-hmm. And so you see that cascade from the parvovirus to the wolf, to the moose, to the vegetation, to the fish. And so I kind of carry that attitude into the martial mm-hmm. arts in Makes a sense. lot of ways. I tend to try to look for commonalities, sure. if you will. Sure. Mm-hmm. I, I think one of the things that we do poorly as an industry is we look for the differences when mm-hmm. I'd much rather look for the commonalities because once we build yeah. that, then the differences actually become an asset. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. okay, you do it this way. I do it this way. Mm-hmm. Let's compare notes. Let's figure out why, because maybe I like your way better or vice versa. And yeah, that's cool. You, you mentioned your, your first instructor. What was it? What changed in your life that you were able to settle down enough that you could commit to a oh. school? And yeah. Why did you pick that school? Well, it sort of picked me. Um, I, at that point, um, just because of the situation, I had left the Fish and Wildlife Service. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a mega commute and it was not doing well for my health. So I had my minimum retirement, Mm -hmm. took a different job and we were building the brewery and I was working in a warehouse. And one of the other warehouse workers, he was a big JKD guy. You know, I had uh, trained with some of the bigger names like Ted Wong, who was one of Bruce Lee's mm-hmm. direct students, um, amongst others. And he just started doing stuff in the uh, in the warehouse. And it I found it really appealed to me because of its emphasis on simplicity mm-hmm. and functionality, things like that. Uh, how do you want to say... Like with the one inch punch, which, you know, I think sometimes gets a little misunderstood, but that idea of bringing everything to bear in a single point. Okay. Now 
athletically, I was a sprinter. And to me, the analogy there was coming out of the blocks, mm. that focusing absolutely everything to coming out of the blocks. Now you're focusing everything. Because especially, punch. you know, if you're, yeah. you're a sprinter, we're talking yeah. up to what, 100 meters? Yeah, well, 400. Okay. Usually now okay. some people run the 800. Like it's a sprint. I ran the 400 in high school. That, that was not a sprint <laughs> yeah. for me. But I understand that it yeah. can be if you're actually a good runner. But races are, are, are especially the shorter mm -hmm. the distance, yeah. are built on how you come out of the blocks. Yeah. So it becomes yeah. really critical. And that, that focus on a single thing and mm -hmm. that maximizing the, the power. And uh, so that those two kind of were analogous. And the thing for me is I, I did a little boxing as a kid. That okay. was weird. My parents didn't want martial arts, didn't want us riding big wheels because we'd get killed. But they got us boxing. But boxing was okay? Yeah. How interesting. Yeah. You know, it's, I'm still trying to figure it out. But um, so I was used to what you'd consider like, I guess, the traditional stance. So this is my strong hand. So I'm out here, jab, jab, drop the bomb there. Mm -hmm. Well, Marcus got me switched around. He's like, do it, lead your strong hand forward and that vertical fist and that line of power. Mm. And it was very interesting because we were, you know, punching the bags of feed in the warehouse and I went from pump, pump, it could hit it hard. I could, and I literally blow the bag up. I could go wow. right into it and ended up having to buy a couple bags of feed. But fortunately we got enough horses and chickens, you know, we can make use of it. But uh, so that's what kind of got me sort of hooked on it, if you will, is like, well, I just went from, you know, zero to 60 yeah. very quickly. And um, yeah, so that was really my initiation into the more organized aspect of martial arts. So there's an important point to, mm -hmm. to put in here because we, we often, uh, unfortunately, mm -hmm. I think, martial arts is seen as a mm -hmm. youthful pursuit, whether mm -hmm. only for, or you at least need to, quote, need mm -hmm. to start as a child, but mm -hmm. you were, very much not a child. It no, sounds no, like. No, it was. Uh, oh gosh, I, I was probably in my early forties by then. I can't remember. The not a common year. age to start. No, no. Um, but you know, I'd always had interest in sure. athletic pursuits and was trying to remain active. And yeah, you know, like I said, I had little things here and there mm -hmm. throughout the the years. And um, you know, it's one of my favorite lines from an old movie is. Uh, um, fistful of dollars where one of the characters says sometimes a man's whole life depends on a mere scrap of information well that's how i look at a lot of things in life is like you pick stuff up and it may not seem important now but you can carry it to later uh, and so that's uh, just kind of how i i looked at things and so yeah i picked up little scraps along the way and i had you know did i guess pretty good. You know, I do, do a little training here and there, but mainly I was more focused on the cycling and the running and a uh, little bit of power lifting there, but I kind of stopped that after a few years just because that's a lot of weight. It's <laughs> a lot of so, weight. can take its toll. Um, and uh, yeah, so this was just like another thing to try and it, it worked for me. I liked it and I've been doing it ever since. Nice. So, What were those early formalized experiences like? You know, I'm assuming you were in a class environment. Uh, no, it was mostly one on one. One on one. Yeah, he, uh, um, his experience in JKD and, and JKD in general tends to work on a smaller groups type thing. Sure. That's and so that was kind of how he had come up. So it was often me and maybe one or two other people. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of a one on one thing. So it could be, it could be pretty intensive. Um, which was nice. I mean, if you made any mistake, it was right there. Um, it wasn't like you were on the other side of the room and right. he didn't Can't see hide. it. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was really good. And uh, it just clicked with me mm -hmm. and it moved well. Um, I, you know, obviously yeah, there was some physiology to get used to it, but it, it just fit, you know, like mm -hmm. I'd find that things he'd be like, okay, now we're going to learn this. And then it'd be like, Oh, I've been doing this all along. So it was correct even though maybe in the past when I was working with someone else briefly, they'd be like, oh, this is totally wrong. And so it just, for whatever reason, it just really seemed to fall together for me. Mm. Yeah. So of course we can't really bring mm. up Jeet Kune Do without mm. talking about Bruce Lee because mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. you know, he's been gone 50 years and he's yeah, still he the most 50th. recognizable mm -hmm. martial artist of all time. 
mm -hmm. at least in the modern era. Yeah. Were you as a kid at all a Bruce Lee fan? Did, did you watch the movies? Like, is that part of mm -hmm. your journey? Uh, not entirely. I, okay. When I was a kid in Green Bay, um, they used to have, on the Sunday mornings and stuff, you know, the day or Saturdays, whatever it was, they'd have the cartoons and then the Harold Lloyd short movies. And then it was the old, uh, you know, the really corny Kung Fu movies, mm -hmm. you know, like guys biting swords and stuff. And, yep. and we had some fun with that. But it was interesting. We were also coming into the whole ninja thing. Mm -hmm. And in the school I went to, martial arts, unfortunately, became like a mini gang thing. You know, there was one mm -hmm. school that had started giving kids multi degree black belts. And so there's this group of kids in school that were all second degree black belts. And they were going to you know, whoop out on the whole school, you know, and the, the Very ninja thing high. started. Yeah. And, you know, there's these gangs of kids that were like, you know, we're ninjas, we got a secret ninja camp, you know, and they claimed that they were trained by a ninja who snuck into the country and all this. And did they have the boots, so, the, the, the two prong, um, the tabby boots? I don't remember <laughs> for sure, but I know one guy got kicked out of Boy Scout camp because he darted someone. He made his little ninja darts and he, he drilled someone with a dart and got tossed out of scout Holy camp. Cow. So that atmosphere was mm -hmm. kind of something that was a little bit of a turnoff really for yeah. me. And, uh, you know, that kind of carried over. And then when I got, um, my family moved from green Bay over to Hudson, then I really got into like track and stuff. So I kind of consumed my time and, uh, kind of didn't really pay much attention to it after that. So, uh, but, yeah, so it really wasn't like I start out with the whole mm. Bruce Lee thing, which a lot of guys do. Absolutely. Um, and uh, I mean, the the fan base is uh, is strong. You know? For sure. <laughs> yeah. For sure. We we anytime we put an episode out that mentions Bruce Lee, mm -hmm. positively or negatively, yeah, it's guaranteed to get some feedback, which is why I think so many martial arts channels, you know, across. The mm -hmm. internet still focus on Bruce Lee because yeah. there's a there's a diehard fan base there. Yeah, yeah, and it 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 um it, it gets I don't know how you want to say it. the the conversation gets weird at mm. times. Uh, it does. You know, it, there's almost um, a tendency to idolize him. I, um, I'd say it's beyond tendency. Then, yeah, there, there and, was I, I saw somebody put something up. So <clears throat> first, I saw recently. <clears throat> fairly recently mm -hmm. michael jai white mm -hmm. was was received a bit of of uh, feedback for mm -hmm. saying for answering someone had asked him the question would you beat bruce lee in a fight mm -hmm. or, or it came up I, I forget if he was asked yeah. directly but you know that was the subject and he said look bruce lee was 135 pounds i'm you know 225 235 yeah. right that 100 pounds matters a lot and mm -hmm. he and mm -hmm. then more recently than that, Mike Tyson mm -hmm. did the same thing saying, look, in his prime, of course, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I think you, any, anybody who, I'm going to be honest, anybody out there who thinks Bruce Lee would defeat Mike Tyson in his prime, mm -hmm. um, I, I think you have some, I think you need to spend more time in a gym. I think mm -hmm. you need to spend more time training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, and that's the thing is, is. You know, I obviously never met Bruce Lee. And so I don't know. I see the movies and stuff. Um, you hear what people talk about him. And uh, he certainly had a, a great talent. Uh, but this whole concept that no one could ever beat him anywhere. And I believe Lee himself made the point that anyone can beat anybody. And that's why you have to train is because you never know what you're going to be up against. Yeah. And, you know, hey, everybody has trouble like in middle school through to high school, whatever. That was actually something I did carry with me. And I don't know if I got from Bruce Lee or whatever, but, you know, play those margins. Mm -hmm. And I remember probably my biggest victory in high school, which taught me a lot about psychology, is there was this group of guys, you know, and one of them's like going to dump his milk on my head. And I said, don't do it. You know, and I'm a little, <laughs> a little nerdy guy as a freshman at the time. And he said, what are you going to do about it? And I said, 
more than you think I can. And I'm just ad living this. This is like yeah. this is like That's something, a brilliant something took over my brain and is like, kid, let me drive. You know? And he goes, Well, you want to step outside? And in a moment of inspiration, I said, I do. And I got up and we start heading down the hall. And just as we get to the door, he turns and he looks at me, he goes, You're nothing but a bop, 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 bop. <laughs> Can't repeat that on camera. And takes off running down a side hallway. And I remember I turned to the crowd of kids behind us and I put my hands out and um, I had, I have like, I was yeah. in tachycardia, you know, and I was just like, thank God I got out of that, you know, <laughs> but I learned a lot from that. The psychology of it is like, you don't have to necessarily win the fight or anything at all. All you have to do is convince the other guy that you want to fight more than him. And he may win that fight, but he's going to get hurt in the process and it's not worth it. Yeah. And, you know, I used to tell people that when I worked in retail, because you'd get people coming, nah, they're yelling at you. And, and you'd literally have a customer say, you want to step outside? The minute you say yes, it's because it, it takes them out of their context. Their thing yeah. is, you're a stupid little clerk. You can't touch me, da, da, da. And then you, I, the customer is always right. But the minute they say it, and you're like, yeah, sure. Now they're out of their groove and you got them mentally. They're... Mm -hmm. You know, so I've, I've been having a day. Yes. Mm -hmm. I would love to let's, yeah, yeah. I, I could, I mm -hmm. could use an outlet. Mm -hmm. So let's go back, go back <clears throat> to forward. Mm -hmm. You started training. Yeah. Was it what you expected? Ooh. I think in some ways it was because, um, you know, Marcus and I had very similar mindsets. Mm -hmm. Um, at one point when I was in graduate school and I knew I was going to be hanging around a bit, I looked into a couple of schools in the Minneapolis, St. Paul area. Mm -hmm. And you know how you meet someone and you can, I don't want to say you dislike them, but you can tell, Hey, cool guy, but I'm not going to fit in with yeah. his program. Well, yeah. and that was kind of the vibe I got from just about every school there, except for one, which was pretty cool, but they wanted like a full year commitment. Mm -hmm. Again, it's like, which was good, it turned out, because I ended up at Isle Royal within like four months. But uh, so I think it, it was good in that, you know, we had very similar mindsets and uh, the way he approached the training and the way he presented it to me uh, worked out really well. I think we, we gelled like that. And, you know, that, that's a pretty rare thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I was talking about, you know, being a fish biologist in all the different places I've worked, it was you know, I, hey, I, you know, I can work with anybody. Mm -hmm. I always make a point to get along with all my coworkers and such. But there was like that one boss and that one field guy where, you know, you guys just, you barely had to talk, sure. you know? And, Same uh, age. Yeah. It's, it's, so that was kind of, yeah. So it worked out, it worked out really well. So to me, it was kind of what I expected or it fit with me, maybe not what I expected. Mm -hmm. It was not what I expected in that it really, he didn't deal with all the tough guy stuff and things like that. And, um, you know, he was a good instructor. This guy was a wrecking machine when he wanted to be, and he probably could have fought Bruce Lee. I don't know. Um, uh, he has since stepped away from martial arts and mm -hmm. his, you know, for his own reasons, um, which is perfectly fine. Uh, but yeah, it was, um, it was a good way to get started for me. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. And how long were you training with him? Uh, well, I want to say it was pretty brief. It was about two and a half years or so. Okay. Yeah. And then what? And then I was pretty much on my own. Really? Um, I tried a few different places, but things were so different. Mm. Um, and one thing too with the JKD is we had a lot of sparring, a lot of contact. Um, you know, that was always a lot of fun. Um, and if you go to another school and everything is like, oh, we're a complete no contact school and things like that, it's, uh, it's a dramatic difference. And if yeah. it's not what you want. And, you know, what kind of, kind of one of the things that shows up the difference is at one point with this one school, I, I went to a few uh, classes at, and they were nice enough guys. One of the instructors there, he was like third or fourth degree black belt. And he mm -hmm. said, well, he, he's like, let's spar open hand, you know, basically tapping, yeah. you know, 
So we're going along and we're doing our thing and he had zero defense and I kept tapping him, you know, mm. forehead, cheek, you know, breaking through. And every time I got through his defense, you know, trap, whatever, um, he'd mutter, nah, that wouldn't work. That wouldn't work. And so in the moment, yeah, you're literally proving yeah, that it's working. I stopped and I, and I was very frustrated and I tried to kind of keep my cool, but I said, well, I said, you're not helping me. I said, when you mutter, that wouldn't work. What do you mean? Because I'm not learning anything yeah. here. And he said, well, he said, do some shadow boxing. I'll come back to you. And that was like, okay, you know, hey, you know. He didn't know what to do. Done, you know. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to make a dramatic exit or anything, but, you know, walk away and find something else. Yeah. Uh, so it was, it was tough. And, uh, you know, and then later on I found my original instructor's instructor was mm -hmm. still going down in mass. And I trained there for four or five years and, um, but it's just kind of impractical. It's almost a four hour round trip. So I couldn't get down there very often. Um, you know, wouldn't mind getting back to it, but right now it's just, yeah, not very practical. Sure. So, sure. So you're running solo. Yeah, pretty much. Um, take on a few students here and there. Um, JKD is not the most popular thing out there. I mean, let's face it, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and Muay Thai are kind of ruling the roost which is fine. You know, there's I, nothing wrong. With this, I, I, I would know? challenge that a little bit. I think okay. it's ruling the conversation, oh, okay. but I, but mm -hmm. I think in, in my mm -hmm. experience, if we look at, you know, mm -hmm. if we add up styles of karate and Kempo mm -hmm. and, and Taekwondo and, you know, the things that have been around for a long time, mm -hmm. Kung Fu, I think they still remain in most places, at least in mm -hmm. the U S cause that's what I have the experience with still remain overall more popular yeah as a as an individual if we break down to individual style especially if we start splitting up yeah. taekwondo styles and karate styles yeah bjj is is likely the most popular yeah 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 nice you know you, you hear the hear the most noise i guess so um so yeah it's uh i got my little place which actually you know i never wanted to be an instructor really i just liked training okay uh, i love the learning process i didn't want the responsibility mm. But because we're in a JKD desert, you're either going to Chicopee Mass or Fishkill, New York. Um, it's a long trip. I kind of had to. To those of you watching, that's group. a long trip. For yeah. Me. Yeah. It's like two and a half one way or four and a half the other. Yeah. And uh, so I kind of had to form my own thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so we were, and, and uh, you know, after I'd been granted training privileges, I What does that trying. mean? Um, basically, the way they did it at the time is you'd been there long enough in your ranks and whatnot. And they said, well, now I want you to start taking on your own students. So I'm okay. granting you training. So training, not your ability to train, your ability to train others. Yes. Got it. Yeah. So bringing in other people, um, which is actually how I met my first instructor. Cause mm -hmm. same thing. And they'd said, okay, we want you taking on your own people. And so he was like, Hey, how about the guy in the, in the warehouse with me? Uh, so we we're looking at that and uh, I was trying to get something going there. And, and again, I wanted to keep it pretty informal, mm -hmm. but then to get the insurance, I had to form a company, mm -hmm. <laughs> which fortunately I knew I'd do an LLC pretty quick, having done it a few times now. Um, but then in a, one of those things is like, I get, okay, yeah, we got it. And then they're like, um, sorry, we're not going to do that insurance anymore. And I'm like, oh. mm -hmm. and then I found Thimble, which was like, yeah, we'll do it for 16 bucks, you know, <laughs> online, boom. Um, but again, you know, we were just having a little trouble getting things going. Uh, so, you know, like I said, take people on, you know, as they show an, someone shows an interest. And that's how I created that Red Tiger Martial Arts and Meditation is mm -hmm. it is a way for people to find me. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the training I do now, uh, I do at Elm City Muay Thai, which is my neighbor down the road, just opened his own place. Cool. And uh, that's pretty cool when he has his open gyms. I mean, obviously, he's very focused on the Muay Thai stuff. Sure. He's very good at what he does. Uh, but a lot of that you can actually adapt to JKD because sure. the Muay Thai guys like to be very simple with their stuff mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, break it down. And uh, so that's pretty good. You know, and when you have the open gym on Saturdays, you can do whatever you want. There's people there, and, you know, so, you know, find somebody, to, hey, let's grab the pads and you, you do your thing. I'll do my thing and we'll compare. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, uh, and even like when I was uh, teaching at uh, the Saturday thing of, uh, a month mm -hmm. ago, the, uh, advanced training Saturday is it was 
a lot of conversation as I had people hitting the pads on the drills and stuff where they were like, Oh, well we do it this way. And, you know, and, and so like it's my old little quote here is I always say, be eclectic in your learning and syncretic in your practice. Yeah. And that's what I mean is like, you know, go to a Muay Thai class, go to a Bagua class and do as the instructor yeah. wants, you know, don't, don't be disruptive, you know, follow that leader, you know, what he wants you to learn. But then think about that and like, okay, now how can I put this into mine? You know, and, and like you watch some UFC stuff. I don't really watch it, but occasionally I'll, you know, watch some clips. But I remember there was one where the announcer, I can't remember who the announcer was, but he kept saying like, oh, he switches to Muay Thai. Now he's going to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And that makes for great theater. But in reality, when you're, when you're actually as a martial artist, you can't be that separate. You can't be like, all right, I'm going to use some Muay Thai. Now I'm going to use some Jiu Jitsu. There has to be a flow there. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by being syncretic. You're eclectic in that I take a class A, I take a class B, class C. But then you have to bring it into your own thing, which leads to my other one, my other favorite little saying, which, you know, sometimes rustles feathers, but I say there's only one martial art but it'll be different for everyone because mm. eventually you create your own martial art, which is another thing that I liked about Jeet Kune Do is one of the things Lee said, and I think this gets overlooked by a lot of his, um, you know, super fans and whatnot is that he always said, my JKD will not be the same as yours. And I got it in my little note here and stuff yeah. where he, he talks about in this article how there's no set format and whatnot. So can we talk yeah. about that? If this mm -hmm. isn't okay to, to yeah. switch gears a little bit, because you, you mm -hmm. before we started recording, mm -hmm. you used the word originalist mm -hmm. to talk about folks that, that train and teach JKD as mm -hmm. they, at least they understand Bruce Lee mm -hmm. having done so. And I've never trained mm -hmm. in Jeet Kune Do. Yeah. I've read some of Bruce Lee's books. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I came away with was... Even even louder than a lot of the writings of, of folks that, that pioneered karate and taekwondo mm -hmm. styles who said, you know, this needs to grow and change. It needs to adapt. Don't codify it, mm -hmm. et cetera. It seemed like Bruce Lee's message was similar and even mm -hmm. louder. Yeah. It, it seems in conflict to me, and I, I don't have enough context yeah. to reconcile it. Yeah, and that, that is the big split, the originalist versus the concepts. And just this morning I heard, or not heard, but read something someone had put online just trashing Dan in Asano because he's the concept guy who went away from Bruce Lee. And, um, I think I didn't think anyone could trash Dan in Asano. <laughs> yeah, Probably tops on the list of people, well, yeah. second to Chuck Norris maybe, mm -hmm. people, but I would love to talk to him. Yes. Asanto, if anybody out there can make that happen. Yes, exactly. That yeah, I, I would too. Uh, and again, you know, I, that's where I think it gets crazy mm -hmm. is you get these two camps and you've got people who've never met somebody, you know, dumping on someone, yeah. you know, that you've never met. Doesn't make sense. Just because of what someone else told you. Right. And I think, again, yeah, that is getting away from the spirit of what he wanted. And if you read his article from... Uh, Black Belt Magazine. It was called Liberate Yourself from Classical Karate, which is actually a bad name. It should have just been called My Idea for Jeet Kune Do. Uh, he very specifically mentions that. He says that there's, you know, there's no set form. It's not this. It's not that. It's more like his ideas and his principles. Now, he definitely had the way he taught people stuff, you mm -hmm. know, and that was probably most exemplified by uh, Ted Wong. You know, like my, my first uh, class ever, Marcus took me through the, my paces and I go, you've learned three kicks and you've learned three punches. And he goes, that's all there is. Spend the rest of your life perfecting it. And that's almost not an exaggeration. And that's a good way to start mm -hmm. that idea of the simplicity and whatnot. But also you have to look at uh, the individual and what works for them. And so 
For me, one thing that worked really well is what we used to call the weak side or rear hook kick. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of throwing it with the lead leg, come with the back leg around. And that worked well for me. Now, that would not be something that necessarily, if you were a hardcore, you know, this is only what Bruce taught, you probably, you probably wouldn't do it. It's not in his book. But I think that gets away from the spirit. Bruce wanted people to experiment. That's how he did things. You know, he took like Wing Chun, uh, fencing and boxing mm -hmm. and combined them. Okay. But he also died when he was 32 years old. So to make him the seal of wisdom, I think is incorrect. And I don't You're, think he would have wanted that. And, and, and take him aside mm -hmm. for a moment. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know mm -hmm. anyone who peaked at 32. Yeah. I don't know anyone that we would put in charge of anything super important mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we would say by the time they were 32, they knew everything they needed to know. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think in a way he's almost, it's like he's in danger of becoming a historical irony, mm -hmm. the iconoclast who's becoming the icon. Mm -hmm. You know, he wanted to disrupt things. He wanted to be the disruptive innovator. And he had a lot of really good ideas. Sure. And it appealed to me. You know, when I see some of these classes where, you know, like the forums and things like that, psychologically, I have a lot of trouble with that. Like mm -hmm. when I took the Bagua class, you know, we had to learn the eight circles. Well, I have trouble with sequences and stuff. Always have since I was a little kid, remembering my own phone number, all that oh, stuff. Okay. Um, I could remember like the first two circles. And then after that, I was freelancing. Um, so to break things down and say, okay, we're going to do three punches, three kicks. And we're going to get as good at that as we can was very appealing. That resonated for you. you know, yeah. Rather than remembering a form learning a few techniques very well and applying those situationally psychologically really worked for me. Mm -hmm. um, but then also have the ability to move within that a little, mm -hmm. you know, to some degree. And I think sometimes as I look deeper into things, I think we, his statements, you know, the classical mess, the man who was you know confined, he was, correct in many ways but he also was maybe overstated a little bit there was a little bit more freedom in there like when i was deal, uh looking into bagua before i took the class i signed up because they had the class over in francis town i knew nothing about it so i was like Perfect. i'll do that you know hey i got a weekend yeah um so i did a lot of research on it and i realized okay you got bagua but if you say bagua is only these eight circles and these 16 moves or whatever you're missing out because mm -hmm. they're there were guys in there that, well, this guy had his branch and he was known for using um, whatever. Uh, can't come to mind right yeah, now. But yeah. there was more variation in there. Right. So I think maybe, uh, and maybe things were different in the late 60s or whatever, um, or just his experience. You know, um, you know, like me, I have the advantage, you know, internet, Amazon, I can get any yeah, book yeah. I want or any video. So, you know, who knows what, what Lee had available to him. But I do think, you know, yes, he, uh, uh, how do you want to say, is I think sometimes the reverence for him can be overdone and he mm -hmm. becomes an impediment to his own art. If you can kind of follow that's, that. I, I think thought. that's, yeah, I, I think that's a good way. Because he, good way I he didn't intend it that way. You know, he wanted this to be something that and that's what i like is it involves with me mm -hmm. and you know like early on there were certain techniques i shied away from just because physically you know hey i was a sprinter mm -hmm. so i'm good this way but well this way mm -hmm. not so good um so sidekicks i was probably the only guy that didn't like sidekicks because i just was terrible at them but then as i got better that became part mm -hmm. of my repertoire so that's one thing I see is that um, Jeet Kune Do is adaptable to each student. You know, and, that, and that was one thing that kind of shied me away early on when I was looking at some schools is they had everybody in rows and everybody's doing the exact same thing. And you look at it, it's like, well, shoot, you know, I can't quite function on that. And uh, so that's, I think, one of the things that makes JKD not maybe the most commercially viable thing is it's great because 
you work in small groups, it's very specialized to each person. That doesn't lend itself to a large school format. Okay. So, All right. What do you do differently? What do you teach differently than what you were taught? How have you, I, I hesitate to use the word improved, mm -hmm. but I, I think ultimately that's how you would view it, right? Mm -hmm. what, what did you take, make your own, and pass on that the, the input looks different from the output? I think, uh, how do I want to say it? I, most of my training, like the pad work and stuff like that, was very much like, okay, give me 10 sidekicks give me 10 front hand leads, that type of thing. I do more combinations with the pads. Um, and I picked that up kind of from uh, working with Elm Say Muay Thai. Mm. And I was like, started doing that. I was like, wait a second, we, we can do this with JKD stuff, you know? Yeah. So now instead of like, okay, do 10 of these, there's the, okay, now let's do rear cross to a body hook mm. and then back to the back fist, things like that. Um, and of course, with the footwork, always, you know, uh, do some stationary stuff, but always trying to incorporate the footwork into everything and make those uh, more combinations, make it a little more practical. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that helps with the students maintain their interest, mm -hmm. too. You know, I, I took one class once and it was interesting just from the endurance perspective where the guy had us do 1,000 front hand leads stationary, you know, on the literally 1,000, yeah, literally 1,000. <sighs> And next morning, your knuckles are black with little white tips and stuff. Yeah. And it was interesting in that, yeah, you know, hey, we can do that. Um, that's possible. But at the same time, it's like, okay, you don't want to do that every day. And, you know, in a practical sense, what does that really give you? Um, not a whole lot. It's a neat thing. Hey, I did it. You know? How long does that take to heal? Because um, you're kind of taking yeah. some time off from doing yeah. that. Yeah, I can't remember for sure. I remember that whole weekend was uh, was brutal. It, it was a good seminar, but yeah, I was like bruised all over the place, and because uh, the other drills and stuff is is pretty rough and tumble. But you can't do that every day, of course. Right, right. And um, you know, and that and that gets to one thing too is is high volume versus more the uh, combos and things like mm -hmm. that. And, and that's one thing where people look at like Bruce Lee's training manuals and stuff, or not manuals his day planners and they're like oh well he did 500 kicks or whatever and this um but also it's the thing that people don't talk about is toward the end of his life he was already having some problems with overtraining problems with his knees and whatnot mm -hmm. and so it's one of those things where like oh if he did it it's got to be good well you know the technology at the time what you know think about it even like when i was in you know early in my track career it's like well you just run more you just run more. I mean, who well, overtraining? What's that? You know, right. you know, we've ha evolved. We've had more, and um, and you you also so, and, and I just want to I just mm -hmm. want to jump in because I think mm -hmm. it's an important concept. If you if you're going to mimic what someone does, mm -hmm. you can't pick and choose, right? Yeah. Even if you forget the fact that Bruce died at 32, mm -hmm. even if you forget that he had some physical challenges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you recovering like him? Are you eating like him? Yeah. Are you, you know, are you doing all these other things that maybe permitted him to do yeah. that? But we see people that pick and choose, right? You yeah. know, it's, it's, the, it's the great, it's the great, I've never trained debate mm -hmm. online. You know, mm -hmm. I'm going to train this and this and this, and then I'm going to be the perfect fighter. It's like, okay, how much training do you have? Zero. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you know, maybe, maybe mm -hmm. you start, maybe you recognize that you can't just look at this person and say, they're great because of this style they trained. Mm -hmm. They're great because this style and all the things they did before and all the things that they are doing to maintain, to prepare for the fight, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, um, you know, that's the thing is, I, I think, like I said, it's it's the almost the irony of it. You know, yeah. you think if Bruce Lee came back now and he would look at me, you know, I'm, 54 and he'd say okay you've outlived me by 20 years and technology has advanced 50 years what have you got to show for it right do i want to sit here and say well you know what you did in december of 1968 i'm doing the exact same so thing. You're, you're saying to summarize you're yeah. saying that you believe bruce would look at you and say how are you better than me yeah pretty much yeah 
how are you that's a reasonable expectation yeah. and and you know you can say like not literally better in terms of one-on-one -on -one, but better in how i'm applying myself right. or, or how have you improved this thing yeah right one of the things and we, we've talked about this on the show and and i you know i'll repeat it for folks who might be new and mm -hmm. you, know, you, you may not have caught those episodes i believe wholeheartedly that there are two ways to teach i can take what i know and i can try to model mold my students into mm -hmm. exactly who and what yeah. i am as a martial artist yeah but they're never going to be as good as me mm -hmm. at being me so mm -hmm. let's say they get close let's say they're 99 percent of me mm -hmm. and then they repeat the same process martial arts gets worse yeah. over time yeah, oh, yeah. or yeah. I can take everything that I know and I can make them the best them as a martial artist. And you, you, mm -hmm. you talked about it yeah. a bit as possible and try to get them there even faster. Yeah. And that's one of the things I'm really working on in my school right now. How do I help them progress as quickly as possible? Yes. Because why would I want to teach them as less than as quickly as possible, right? Efficiency mm -hmm. is relevant. So then theoretically martial arts improves over time. Mm hmm because it's yeah. never going to stay exactly the same. Yes. Yeah. And that's true. And that's why I think it is so insane that you see these instructors who take it as a personal insult if a student does any outside research on their own. I mean, you know, that's where you, you want, you know, yeah. that, that, I don't know, insecurity or whatever it is where, I, I you know, a person a can't train with anyone else. And, um, right. you know, my wife is in the horse business, which is kooky as anything. <laughs> um you know, that's her sideline. She's mm -hmm. an eye doctor. Well, actually, no, maybe the horses are more than an eye doctor. But, um, and you'll see that too, mm -hmm. where, you know, there's a, I don't know, like a dressage coach. I was wondering if you good. were calling dressage. And, uh, yeah, oh, God. <laughs> um, the moment you said kooky, I went, are we going dressage? Yes. And For those of you who don't know. Yeah. You're... Don't let your daughter see a horse. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, they'll be like that. You train with someone else you you can never come back you know and it's like no it's it, there has to be that that ongoing continuing education within the self yeah you know and you can't expect your students not to have that right. and then you always learn something from you know someone uh in you know and just have that open mind you know i hear Occasionally you hear people talk, well, I had this student come to me and he was terrible, he was terrible, he was terrible. And so just to kind of stir the pot a bit, because I really didn't like the conversation online, I said, oh, what'd you learn from that student? And the response was, well, that there's a lot of crappy instructors. And I said, no, and what did you learn from the student? And I got a salty Are reply. students supposed to be good? You know, Do you have to be good yeah. to start yeah. something? That seems like a terrible way yeah. to look at things. People have that attitude sometimes. Right? They do. It, it, it You're sounds not like good enough to take lessons. You gave yeah. the example yeah. of, of the person that you, you sparred with yeah. and mm -hmm. you know the mumbling. Yeah. Right? That person should see that as an opportunity, either yeah. to learn from you or to teach you better, one, yeah. one way or the other. But the idea that you know was very clear that person was insecure yeah. and that's really unfortunate yeah. and, and you know I, I was really lucky growing up my instructors if somebody came in you know they, I, I remember green belts coming in mm -hmm. and they go oh, you do something different than us what can you teach us mm -hmm. right and I, I didn't realize at the time because I was a kid mm -hmm. how unique especially for the 80s that was yeah and mm -hmm. that's always been my attitude you know I have students now and half of them more than half of them have some prior training Mm -hmm. guess what i'm not nitpicking yeah. at this because they're you know the school's six months old you know mm -hmm. but i'm not nitpicking no your punch has to be like this not like this yeah in the kata it does mm -hmm. but if you want to spar with your hand like this i'm fine with that mm -hmm. because if you're more comfortable punching that way you're gonna be a better puncher that way yeah. cool if yeah. I want them to punch differently, it's up to me to show them this is a better way and show them yeah. why rather than just, you have to do it my way because I said so. There are some times yeah. I pull rank. Well, in, yeah. but it's it, not it, you know, if there's somebody doing something that's potentially injurious yeah. or something. Or, or, yeah. or maybe, the, maybe whatever it is, there's something that layers on mm -hmm. top of it. And because they, they don't have the experience to see the whole thing, mm -hmm. they're not going to understand. I say, I just need you to trust me. You yeah. know, that comes into play too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and 
I think that's the thing. I can give you a good little anecdote here sure. from my my time in, in track is if you remember Ben Johnson, yeah, the guy that got busted for steroids, mm-hmm. um, but he had a kind of unique starting style, okay. and he would get very low in the blocks. He'd put his hands all the way out in his lane as far as he could, and he'd just rock it out, and he'd he'd come up quick. You mm-hmm. know, it used to be he'd stay low and all this. Well, I was a terrible starter, so I mimicked Ben Johnson's way of starting. And I had a rocket start and I didn't have great downfield speed. So, you know, I had to get out quick Mm. and I could generate enough power to give you an idea on indoor tracks where we weren't allowed to wear spikes. We had to wear just rubber molded shoes. Remember Mm -hmm. those old Nikes Mm -hmm. with the chiclets on them? I I could come out of the box with enough force. I tear those little rubber chiclets off the bottom of my shoes. That's cool. I mean, I could generate force like you wouldn't believe. Well, I get into college and my first college coach, he's like, I don't like your start. You look like you're overstriding me. And I was like, oh, you know, and I, you know, even though I had a pretty good time, you know, for our division and all that. So the next meet, I humor him, bring my arms together. And he goes, oh, he goes, you look good on that start. And I finished like eighth place, you know, like dead last or maybe second to last. And he goes, but it looked really good. He's like, I like your technique now. And to me, that was just like, roll my eyes. And on a personal level, I liked the coach. He was a nice guy. He wasn't a jerk. But he was so set in that a guy's got to come out of the blocks looking like this. Right. There's one way. Regardless of way. the time. You know? And I think that's a, a thing that as an instructor, we you really got to get away from. Yeah. And, uh, you know, okay, here, here's a good way to do it. You know, I want you to try that vertical fist and work with me on that. And then as you get good on that now, okay, you move your own thing into it and things like that. Um, I I like that individuality, you know, and I I think that's sometimes where you come into, you know, and I I understand, you know, like with belts and rankings, it's good. It gives an incentive. It gives like a, you know, a goal and Mm -hmm. all that. What do you do when you have two people that complete say whatever belt you know we'll say the black belt they both go through the same sequence and i actually did see video of this and they both accomplish it but you can tell one has definitely got more to them mm-hmm. than the other one and okay how do you handle that right you know because clearly they're not on the same level although they've completed the same work it depends on what that belt means yeah. at that school. And, you know, uh, mm-hmm. one of the things we talk about, maybe not often, but we did for a time on this show was mm-hmm. rank means different things at different schools. Yeah. And not only is that not bad, it's good. I think mm-hmm. that's good. Yeah. Because different schools, different whys, different instructors, different experiences. Yeah. You know, there are people out there who who want to go the exact opposite of you know, the philosophies that we're talking about that, Mm -hmm. you know, we're on the same page about, and they want standardization, not just within individual arts, but across the arts. Yes. Yeah. I've seen that argument. People talking about that. I was like, good luck. (laughs) My, my first response to that is always, okay, let's, let's pretend for a moment that that is a good idea. Mm -hmm. Who gets to decide? Yeah. And they always want to be the one that decides or their instructor is the one that decides. Well, why Mm -hmm. them? Why are they the authority? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take long when you argue down those lines to realize there is no authority. Mm-hmm. There is no person that is best at everything. Nobody gets to determine. Yeah. And, and that's why people, you know, people like to challenge me, you know, there is no definition of what is and is not a martial art. Yeah. I have mine, mm-hmm. but is it mm-hmm. the definition? Yeah. yeah. You have yours. Yeah. It probably overlaps mostly, probably mm-hmm. some differences. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Because without the differences, we don't identify those elements to change. Mm-hmm. And without the change, we can't have the progress. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, and I think, again, that's why it's good to go out there and, and be around. Because, you know, like if like me, going up against the Muay Thai guys, I get a totally different look. Yeah. And they get a different look, too. Yeah. And so we both kind of see something different. We can learn something. And, yeah, and as, as to rank it, it makes me think of a time where um, – you know, I, I, before I even had my first rank JKB, you know, open sparring guy, another guy, black belt, multiple stripe. I can't remember for sure, but he was terrible. 
mm. and um, very slow moving. And it was just, I don't know, you know, it's kind of one of those things where you got done and you're like, man, what just happened? Mm. Opposite of that, Red Belt from a now defunct school, but um, the instructor was very good and he pushed guys hard. Um, you know, I guess one could argue his methods, but he tended to produce <laughs> good guys. And he had a red belt that was, it was like sticking your hand into a wood chipper. I mean, the guy was good. Yeah. And yet he's wearing a red belt. Okay, so who's the better martial artist? Right. You know? Right. And, and, that, and that's why fighting it's ability. That, how do we define that, right? So that's yeah. where the definitions, yeah. what, what about the other things? Mm-hmm. You know, there yeah. are plenty of great fighters out there that are not good people. Exactly. Is, is yep. that also part of being a good martial artist? Yeah. To me, it is. It doesn't have to be to somebody else. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, another one of my things that I actually, my last article for, for your magazine there is I was talking to Warrior Marshalljournal.com. to Sage. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the whole warrior to sage yeah. idea is, okay, you can be a warrior. Okay. But if all you focus on is the warrior aspect. You sell yourself short. You got to move on and be the sage. And to my mind, that's Master Po from Kung Fu, my favorite, yeah. all-time favorite character. Yeah, yeah. And that's why he's great is because he's he's a fictional character, so we don't ever have to worry about him getting getting arrested, you know, <laughs> doing something. And uh, But, you know, just how he, he had that calm, mm-hmm. that insight, and yet when he had to fight, he had to. You know, and uh, so that is kind of my, I guess, ideal if I need to have. One. Yeah. And, and mm-hmm. you know, literature is full of that that contrast between mm-hmm. the warrior and the the other. Right. The scholar, mm-hmm. the better to be a warrior in a garden mm-hmm. than a gardener in a war. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, we, we can find yeah. those all over the place. And I, I think. I think that if the entire value that one derives from martial arts mm-hmm. training is only utility in combat, mm-hmm. then it's a waste of time yeah. because very few of us are going to get into more than one or two fights mm-hmm. in our future. Mm-hmm. And if you do get into lots of fights, then it probably says something about you or where you live. Yeah. Right. I'm not, I'm not going to mm-hmm. say that everywhere is safe and, and mm-hmm. free of violence. But I look at it and I say, look at all this other good stuff. Yeah. I'm going to put some time into that because I am going to need discipline and confidence and et cetera, et cetera, mm-hmm. every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So all those things too. Oh, yeah. No, I, I see a bit of an analogy there. I was a bear safety instructor with Fish and Wildlife you know, uh-huh. up in Alaska. And, um, you know, we did the whole, the guns thing. You know, that was our martial art. Yep. You know, practice with the bolt action rifle, which actually by the time I left, they discontinued because so many people, everybody's into the semi-autos now that yep. people are coming in. They're like, what's this? And it's like, well, that's a bolt action rifle, you know, and you had to do your rapid fire and you had to learn it. And the importance of whatever you learn on is what you take with you mm-hmm. and all this. But then we also went into the ecology and behavior of bears and things like that. And you know, like I told him, this is actually the most important part. The important part isn't killing a bear. Because if a bear comes into your camp and you kill it, whatever brought in that first one's going to bring in the next one. Yeah. So what you focus on is making that bear not want to come into your camp in the first place. Because it's a bear safety course, yeah. not a bear hunting course. Yes. If it was a bear hunting yeah. course, then yeah. maybe the guns would be 90% yeah. of it. And um, it was, you know, like I tell people, is the first part, is the deterrence mm. and the, basically almost camouflaging yourself to the bear. And you get good enough at that first part, we're never going to need the second part. And everybody thinks, oh, it's so cool, man, you shoot a bear. And so the first time you ever hear a big Kodiak growl and you know you're the subject of their displeasure, it is crazy. Yeah. And you realize when that bear slaps the ground and then turns around and leaves it's the biggest relief you'll ever feel uh, you know because the whole thing it's like yeah you know because when they move you if you're lucky you got one shot i mean you have to put three in the moving target but let's be realistic here so you want to be in that 
zone where it's like you anticipate, you understand their behavior. Mm -hmm. And that's to me kind of going from the warrior to the sage. The warrior knows how to kill the bear. The sage knows how to never have to kill the bear. So you have that skill, but, you know, and and so I see it as as the same thing here. Mm -hmm. You know, the martial arts, it's great. It's, you know, Let's do it. Let's mix it up. Let's have some fun. It's good. Um, But maybe the more important part is that psychology Mm -hmm. of, you know, like, hey, you know, it's like I used to tell people my greatest martial art was being a sprinter because when I had a car pull up in the center of River Falls, Wisconsin, and some guy yells something at me and I said, what are you talking about? And all of a sudden I got this float of guys with baseball bats coming at me. Bing! Because not one of them, you know, some some guy with a big old beer gut carrying a baseball bat, he ain't going to beat me to the corner. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's like, you know, okay, I could have stood and fight, but what would have been the point? Exactly. You know? Well, so. probably probably wouldn't have been a great story for you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, get out, you know. You know, let's be smart. Know how to anticipate and understand and just... Walk away, you know, and sometimes, okay, yeah, the guy goofed on you, he spit on you, whatever. It's like better than, you know, because anytime you get into a quote unquote real fight, um, you're going to get hurt. It, getting hit sucks. Mm-hmm. And who knows, someone else may jump in and it'll get even worse. So avoidance, I think. I, I, <laughs> I'm, you know? I'm right there with you. You know, so, I, I tell people, mm-hmm. people will will ask me to teach self-defense, mm-hmm. you know, or what are my self-defense credentials? How mm-hmm. have I fared in fights? Mm-hmm. I say, look, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm not the best person in the world to teach you self-defense. Mm-hmm. I am one of the best people to teach you how to not get into a fight. Yeah. Because I'm a, I grew up a small nerd mm-hmm. and I've managed to de-escalate since fourth grade. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. I'm good at that. No. Yeah. That's a valuable skill. I'll, yeah. I teach people that. Oh, yeah. No, it is. That's funny. I used to get that, too. People would be like, hey, man, how many bears have you killed? It's like, you know, that's not the point. Again, this is not a bear hunting course. Yeah. This is a bear safety yes. course. Don't you know, apply the bear spray to your yeah. skin. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like, they used to joke, yeah, the bear spray is like you, you pop the cap and zap the guy next to you and take off running, you know. But, uh, yeah, was, uh, you only have to be faster than the slowest exactly. guy in your group. Exactly. You know? So. <laughs> Yeah. So what, what's coming next for you? You know, we look down the pipe here and... and... Yeah, I'd, I'd, what I'd really like to do is I'd like to get a, a consistent JKD group going in our area. Cool. Um, just so we have people to train with. Mm-hmm. And I don't necessarily see myself as the instructor there or Shifu, however you want to yeah. term it. I'd see it more as like a group of guys, similar interest or ladies to anybody and we can kind of teach and learn from each other. And I have no problem being the leader of that group, you know, and keeping There's a things going. Being leader and instructor. Yeah. And, 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 and that's, I think it's an important distinction. I see myself yeah. as the leader mm-hmm. in my martial arts group. Just yeah. Me. And and that's what I'd like to do is get mm-hmm. something consistent going. I have a small place in what used to be our brewery. And I train people there a bit. Um, we'd probably need to get something a little more. If it was still a brewery, you'd yeah. probably have great attendance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, hey, it was fun while it lasted, but, uh, you know, time moves on. You evolve, you know. You have to. And, uh, yeah, so I'd just like to get a, a consistent group going. Um, and, uh, you know, so I have people to train with, and mm-hmm. they can pursue their interests also and try to keep it casual. I have no interest in running a large school or even making it my career. In fact, I'd rather not make it my career. Sure. You know, as much as I loved having the brewery, it took a hobby to a career. It and always changes that, things. Yeah. And people are now are like, hey, what about this and this? It's like, I don't even look at the craft beer section anymore. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah. Been there, done that. Yeah, you know, moved on. Had, had a lot of fun with it. Met some great people. And it's just. I think the yeah. sweet spot for mm-hmm. most of us, and I'm not mm-hmm. going to say everyone, because there are plenty of people yeah. out there whose dream is to make their career teaching martial arts. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, mm-hmm. I, I love that and I support that. And I, I part of my jo- my career is supporting that yes. and working with those schools. For me personally, mm-hmm. I think the sweet spot is having a school and making some money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, as long enough, as you're covering and, your costs and yep. whatnot, yeah. Enough yeah. money that, you know, you can put a few bucks in your pocket, you know, go out to eat once in a while, mm-hmm. do some fun stuff for your students, and you cover your rent and your insurance and, and whatever. I think I think that's the best. Yeah. Because yeah. You, you, if, if a student leaves, you know, call, man, how am I going to eat next week? Yeah. Right? Or, oh, man, you know, if I could have stretched that trial, then this, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and I want to be super clear to the audience. I'm not saying that people shouldn't do that. And I'm not saying, you know, I mean, take a look at what we do. We have plenty of resources. Like, mm-hmm. I'm just saying that I think for a lot of people out there, I think we are the majority. We get to a point where yeah. part of our development as martial artists is teaching to pass on yeah. because anybody who's taught knows you learn in a whole different way. Yes. You're like, oh, yeah. oh, I didn't know you could do it wrong in that way. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and even in the, a month ago, yeah. the Saturday thing, one of the people caught on when I went for the double trap, I was actually doing it two different ways. Mm. And he said, you know, if you come over the top, you have a better elbow position to maintain the trap. I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. Because I'd always been taught to do it as a sweep under. Mm -hmm. And now you're here. But if you go over the top, now Mm -hmm. you've got the person really jammed. Okay, now you're not in as good a position to punch, but they're also in much less able to get away from you. And um, so you, you mere scraps of information. That's right. You know, getting that different perspective and uh if people want to get a hold of you how do, how do they do that website social media anything yeah um i uh put up a little thing on facebook okay. so uh red tiger martial arts and meditation okay. and, and get uh, into the meditation yeah yeah that's what i was that actually started long before the martial arts okay. we're gonna have to chat yeah. chat about that another time but yeah or red tiger arts at gmail.com so um yeah absolutely uh Anybody in our area, the Keene, New Hampshire, Monadnock region, definitely look me up. Always looking for new people to train with. I'm going to pass it back to you in a moment to mm-hmm. close this out. But to the audience, thanks for sticking around. Thanks for watching or listening. Appreciate you. And remember, what's our mission here at Whistle Kick? We're trying to get everybody in the world to train. Our, mm-hmm. We're here to connect, educate, and entertain. You have a part in that. You have a role to play, whether that's recommending a mm-hmm. guest mm-hmm. or following us, buying a thing, telling people about a thing, you know, whatever it is that works for you to help grow what we are doing in our mission Mm -hmm. is appreciated. So Tim, what do you want to leave the audience with today? We've we've been all over the place, which is by design. It's what I love about this show. How do you want to close out? What do you want to tell them? Um, Yeah. My, my favorite personal quote, be eclectic in your learning and syncretic in your practice. Now, uh, hopefully that's good enough. It is good enough, <laughs> of course. Thanks, All man. right, Thanks excellent. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah.